This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Star Wars X-Wing. Star Wars X-Wing is a miniatures game published by Fantasy Flight and takes about 30 to 45 minutes to play. This is essentially a tactical dogfight game with some gorgeous Star Wars miniatures. The core set includes everything you need to get started. In this game you can play as the Rebel Alliance or as the Empire. Whichever side you want to play, you'll first need to learn to be a pilot. And what better place to learn to pilot starships than at the Flight Academy? For our ship navigation tutorial, we're going to use a standard X-Wing fighter. I want to first draw your attention to the miniature's base. If you look closely, you'll notice that there are two nubs in the front of the base and two nubs in the back of the base. These are the guides for placing maneuver templates. Maneuver templates are basically little rulers that tell you the distance that the miniature can move. You will secretly select which of these templates you're going to use to move your ship with the maneuver dial. Each ship in Star Wars X-Wing has a specific number of maneuvers that they can perform. Each of these maneuvers is built into the maneuver dial. You spin the maneuver dial to secretly select a maneuver for your ship. You then place the maneuver dial face down until it's your turn to activate your ship. When it's your turn to move, you flip the dial over and reveal your choice, and then execute the maneuver. Now, let's look at these maneuvers in greater detail. This is a 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter flight training space. I'm going to use this training space to demonstrate the maneuverability of the X-Wing fighter. Each of your ship's maneuvers will always be secretly planned on the maneuver dial. The maneuver templates come in three groups. The first group are straight templates. These templates allow you to move forward as well as perform the 180 degree Koi Grand turn. The next group are bank templates. Bank templates come in three different sizes and allow a ship to make a 45 degree banking maneuver. Finally, we have turn templates. Turn templates come in three sizes and allow a ship to make a 90 degree turn. First, let's move forward at maximum speed. Looking at our maneuver guide, we can see that the maximum forward speed of the X-Wing is 4. We select this on our maneuver dial, and then place it face down on the play space. When it's our turn to move, we flip the dial over to reveal our choice. We then select the 4 straight template and fit it into the guides at the front of the miniature base. Next, carefully move the X-Wing to the other end of the template and fit it into the rear guides on the model base. You may now replace the template and the move is complete. Next, let's perform this X-Wing's most difficult maneuver, the Koi Grand Turn. The Koi Grand Turn is a speed 4 maneuver. You'll notice on the X-Wing maneuver grid that this maneuver is colored red. A red maneuver puts incredible stress on the ship. So let's play through this type of red maneuver. First we're going to select the Koi Grand Turn on our movement dial. We then place the dial face down. And when it's time, we reveal our choice. When it's our turn, we fit the four straight maneuver template into the front guides of the miniature base. We move the miniature to the far end of the maneuver template and then flip it around 180 degrees to complete the turn. Now, because we conducted a red maneuver, we will put a stress token near the miniature. While a ship has a stress token, it cannot execute any red maneuvers or perform any special actions. To take the stress off the ship, 
the next move must be a green move. Green maneuvers are simple maneuvers like flying straight at a speed or one or two to remove the stress from the ship. Let's look at the other two types of maneuver templates. You can also make 45 degree bank maneuvers or you can also conduct a right turn at 90 degrees. There are other special maneuvers that certain pilots can pull off in the game, but we'll cover off on those a little later. These are the basics you need to know for operating a starship. Now, let's talk about obstacles in the playfield. And for our example, I'm going to bring in an asteroid. Now, according to the rules, during the planning phase, players cannot use maneuver templates in order to test where ships will end up. Instead, they must plan their maneuvers by estimating their ship's movement in their heads. So, players who experience spatial relationship problems, whether that be genetics or temporary alcohol-related effects, may find this next bit a little challenging. Let's say we're going to skirt past the asteroid with a speed 3 90 degree turn. This seems like it will work. And thankfully, it does. However, if we were slightly impaired and thought we could pull this off with a speed 3 45 degree bank, Well, maybe not so much. So now that we have a potential collision on our hands, how do we handle this? Whenever a ship executes a maneuver at which either the maneuver template or the ship's base physically overlaps an obstacle token, then execute the maneuver as normal, but skip the perform action step. Next, you're going to roll one attack dice. The ship then suffers any damage or critical damage as a result of that roll. Now, let's look at what happens when ships overlap. Normally, ships can move through space occupied by other ships without penalty. It is assumed the ships have sufficient time and room to maneuver around the other ships in 3D space. Basically, when completing a maneuver, as long as your ship's base moves past other ships' bases and ends its maneuver not touching another ship base, then it's fine. However, if the move ends and the bases are touching, then you have overlap. When this happens, the maneuvering ship gets bumped back until it's just touching the ship that intersected its maneuver. Whenever ship's bases are touching, they cannot target each other during the combat phase. And as an additional penalty, you're going to skip this ship's perform action step. Reading between the lines on the rules, I'm assuming that the pilot sacrifices his action to swerve away from the other ships, thus cutting his trajectory short. The backing up action just decides where the swerve ends the movement. Next, let's look at the weapon and defense systems. The X-Wing base game comes with 10 pilot cards six TIE Fighter pilot cards, and four X-Wing pilot cards. Let's take a closer look at one of these cards to see what the statistics mean. This is a pilot card for an X-Wing rookie pilot. This card has a number of important stats that you will need to learn to play the game. Going around the card, our first stat is Skill, Weapon Rating, Agility Rating, Hull Rating, 
and shield rating. This icon shows the ship type, which is an X-Wing. This upgrade bar shows the available upgrade cards that can be used by this pilot. This number is the squad point cost. And this is the action bar, which shows you the eligible actions you can take during combat. The next section lists either background text or, on more advanced pilots, their additional special ability. And this section will show you which faction the ship is a member of. Many of these statistics are repeated on the miniature's base. Covering the stats on the miniature's base, we have the ship type, the skill rating, weapon rating, agility rating, hull rating, and the shields rating. We also have a repeat of the icons on the action bar. And finally, a stat unique to the miniature base is the firing arc. Now, let's look at these key ship statistics and we'll see what abilities they enable. First is the pilot skill. Pilot skill is a rank from 1 to 9, with 9 being the highest. Pilot skill is primarily used to establish the order of play. Specifically, the pilot with the highest skill gets to move last and conduct combat first. The next key attribute is your weapon rating. The number on your weapon rating tells you the number of attack dice you can use. Next is the agility rating. The agility rating number tells you the number of defense dice you can use. Next is the hull rating. The hull rating number tells you the number of damage cards you can be inflicted with before your ship is destroyed. Finally, we have the shield rating. The shield rating number tells you the number of shield tokens you get. Shield tokens are used to absorb hits. Now, let's look at the firing arc in conjunction with the range ruler. To determine if a ship is in range, you're going to move the range ruler across your firing arc. The range ruler is divided into three sections. The first section is close range. If a target is within close range, then the attacker gets an additional attack dice. Section 2 is medium range. There is no bonus or penalty for being at medium range. And Section 3 is long range. A target at long range gets a bonus of one additional defense dice. To be able to target an enemy ship, at least part of the ship's base must be within the established range. So in our example, you can see that TIE Fighter number 1 is outside the firing range. However, TIE Fighter number 2 is slightly within the firing range and is eligible for attack. TIE Fighter 3 is well within the firing range and eligible for an attack. Unfortunately, because TIE Fighter 3 is at such a great distance, it gets a plus 1 defense dice if we choose to attack this target. This is a good example of how the range ruler works. We'll cover off on these combat tactics more in our gameplay example. Now let's take a look at the unique 8-sided dice that Star Wars X-Wing uses for gameplay. Red dice denote attack dice. Green dice denote defense dice. If the face of the dice is blank, then there's no effect. Nothing happens with your attack, and nothing happens with your defense. Next for attack dice are two variations of a hit. The first hit is signified by a filled-in burst symbol. If this symbol is rolled and the hit is successful, then it's recognized with a face-down damage card against the enemy ship. The next hit dice indicator is the burst symbol with an empty center. This symbol represents a critical hit. A critical hit results in a damage card with the face up. Face up damage cards have additional damage ramifications. 
The counterpart to the two hit dice on the defense side dice is the evade symbol. Rolling the evade symbol allows you to nullify one hit or one critical hit dice. When nullifying hits or critical hits, there is a priority. All regular hits must be resolved first before you can nullify a critical hit. Finally, both attack dice and defense dice have a focus symbol. If a focus dice is rolled, and if that ship's pilot has activated their focus ability, then they can use their focus token. Activating a focus ability generates a focus token. By playing a focus token, the player can modify one of their focus dice rolls. With attack dice, a focus symbol can then be changed to a hit symbol. And from a defense perspective, a focus symbol can be changed to an evade symbol. These are how the key statistics interact with each other in a combat situation. Let's say we have a TIE Fighter and an X-Wing in a dogfight. The TIE Fighter is attacking and gets two attack dice from his attack rating of 2. The X-Wing is defending. The Rookie Pilot has an agility rating of 2 and is granted two defense dice. The X-Wing has a shield rating of 2 and gets two shield tokens. And finally, has a hull rating of 3, which grants them the ability to absorb 3 damage card hits. Let's say the TIE Fighter rolls a hit. In this order of defense, first, the X-Wing will attempt to dodge the shot by rolling 2 agility dice. Failing that, the hit will be absorbed with a shield token. Once the shield tokens are depleted, then the shot will impact on the X-Wing's hull. The X-Wing's hull can only absorb three hits before it is destroyed. While we're talking about damage, let's look at the damage cards a little more closely. Critical damage effects come in two types. The first type is a temporary effect. Once resolving the effect, you will place the card face down and it will become a normal damage card. The second type is a permanent effect. The critical effects for this type of damage will continue throughout the remainder of the game. The first group of cards affect the pilot. The pilot can be temporarily blinded or permanently stunned. Now these are the only pilot-based critical damage cards in the core set. Everything else is ship-related critical damage. Starting with the cockpit, the sensor array can also be temporarily damaged, and a temporary console fire can spring up. For permanent damage, you can suffer from a damaged cockpit. Critical damage can also result in temporary weapon malfunctions and munitions failure. Finally, engine and structural damage can result in several different temporary and permanent effects on the ship. Minor explosions, structural damage, thrust control fire, and permanent crippling effects to your ship, like a damaged engine, minor hull breach, or a direct hit. And now you can see that critical damage affects ships in several different ways and can easily turn the tide of battle. Now, let's look at the actions and upgrades available in the core game. The icons on the actions and upgrade bars on the pilot card fall into two groups. Actions are abilities inherent to the ship itself. For example, all X-Wings have a specific set of actions, and all TIE Fighters have a specific set of actions. 
upgrades are additional enhancements to your ship. The action bar is in the lower half of the pilot card. This bar shows the eligible actions a player can take after they activate their ship. During the activation phase, each ship may perform one action immediately after moving. In this example, the rookie pilot can activate their focus ability. The focus action can be used to generate a focus token. This focus token can be spent to either change a red focus to a red hit or a green focus to a green evade. The rookie pilot can also choose a target lock for their action. Now let's look and see how target locks work. First you're going to place the range ruler. To establish a target lock, the player is going to measure 360 degrees around their ship to see which ships are at a range of 1 to 3. The TIE Fighter is within range, so a target lock is established. Place one red target lock marker by the TIE Fighter. Place the corresponding blue target lock marker near your ship. The benefit of a target lock is if you're attacking a locked ship and make a poor attack roll, you can trade in these tokens to re-roll your dice. Specifically, you can choose which dice you want to re-roll, which is very useful. Now, let's look at the remaining actions that can be conducted by TIE Fighters. In this example, the Academy Pilot can activate one of its three actions. The TIE Fighter has a focus action, which we've covered off on previously, a barrel roll action, and an evade action. Conducting the evade action allows the Academy Pilot to generate an evade token. This evade token can be spent to create an additional evade roll in combat. Now let's look and see how a barrel roll maneuver works. After you announce a barrel roll as your action, you're going to take the one speed straight template and place it on the side of the ship you want to barrel roll to. When barrel rolling, you can decide where along the side you want to place the template. I'm going to place the template at the top of the base. You then roll the ship over across the template and you can choose on which of the opposite side you want to slide the ship to. I'm going to choose the bottom of the base. And that's how you conduct a barrel roll. Each ship has an upgrade bar at the bottom of their pilot card. This bar shows the eligible upgrade categories for that ship. The player may install one upgrade for each category listed. For example, the Rookie Pilot's X-Wing is eligible for one torpedo upgrade and one astromech upgrade. A quick note about adding upgrades. When you're playing with squad building rules, each side has a limited number of points they can spend on ships and upgrades. Typically, each player has about 100 squad points to build their force. Therefore, in this example, we would add up all the squad points to see our total. Thus, you would add the 21 squad points for the X-Wing, 4 squad points for the Proton Torpedoes, and 3 squad points for the R2-F2 unit for a total of 28 points. The core game comes with five upgrade cards. Two of these are elite upgrades, one torpedo upgrade, and two astromech upgrades. First we have determination. The determination upgrade allows you to ignore one critical damage card. Marksmanship Marksmanship allows you to modify any focus rolls. The first focus roll can be changed to a critical hit, and any other focus rolls can be changed to regular hits. 
Proton torpedoes allow you to spend a target lock to roll four attack dice. You may also change one of your focus results to a critical hit. R2-D2 allows you to regenerate one shield token for conducting a green maneuver. And R2-F2 allows you to increase your agility by one until the end of the round. Additional upgrade cards are packed with the ship expansions. Now, let's put everything we've learned together in a full gameplay example. First, you're going to lay out the play field. The standard size play field is 90 centimeters by 90 centimeters, or for us Americans, 3 feet by 3 feet. Next, around your play area, set up space for the various maneuver templates, a stack of damage cards, the range rulers, gameplay tokens, and the dice. We are going to set up Mission 1 from the rulebook. In this mission, on the Rebel side is the Red Squadron pilot and the Senator's shuttle. Place another Rebel pilot card face down to represent the Senator's shuttle. For our example, I'm going to duplicate the marker and place it on top so we can easily read the stats. On the side of the Imperial Navy are two Academy pilots. I would recommend using the ID tokens on each of the TIE Fighter miniatures to keep track of them. Now let's listen to a mission briefing to understand the scenario. Mission 1, Political Escort. En route from Dantooine, a rebel senator's fleet was ambushed by the Empire and nearly wiped out. The senator himself escaped in a shuttle but a stray blast knocked out his ship's hyperdrive and sensors. Utterly reliant on his escort, the rebel senator can do little more than go straight forward and hope he reaches the outskirts of a friendly system soon. Unfortunately, the Imperial fleet has already dispatched fighters to round up the survivors. Now, the rebel escort must protect the senator until he can reach safety, but the Imperials won't make it easy. Now, each player is going to select a faction and we will continue with the setup. First, we will set up the rebel faction. Take the range ruler and place it at the bottom of the play area. This end of the play area is the Rebel Setup Edge. The Senator's Shuttle Marker is to be placed in the very center of Range 1. The Rebel player will then be able to place his X-Wing miniature anywhere in Area 2. Now we're going to set up the Imperial Faction. The top of the play area is the Imperial Edge. The Imperial player may place his two TIE Fighters anywhere in range 2. Next we're going to activate shields by placing shield tokens. In this scenario, the only ship that has shields is the X-Wing Fighter, so we're going to place two shield tokens near the pilot card. And with that, the mission is set up and we're ready to start playing. The objectives of this scenario are as follows. For a rebel victory, the Senator's shuttle must flee off the Imperial player's edge of the play area. For an Imperial victory, the TIE fighters must destroy the Senator's shuttle. So let's get started by learning the phases of gameplay. In Star Wars X-Wing, a game round is divided into four phases. Phase one is planning, in this phase, each player secretly plans his ship's maneuvers. Phase 2 is activation. In this phase, we'll reveal our dial, set our template, execute our maneuver, check for pilot stress, clean up, and then perform the action. Phase 3 is combat. 
In this phase, we declare our targets, roll attack dice, modify the attack dice, roll the defense dice, then modify those defense dice, compare the overall results, and then deal out the damage. And finally is the end phase. In this phase, we're going to remove any unused action tokens, we're not going to remove target locks, and we resolve any card end phase abilities. Now we begin our game with the planning phase. So let's bring in the ship consoles with all the maneuvers. Now you'll notice that the Senator's shuttle is damaged. It can only make speed 1 banks to the right or left or speed 2 forward movements. First, let's look at the Imperial player. Now since the Senator's shuttle only needs to cross the map to win the game, we're going to close the distance as quickly as possible with our TIE Fighters. For each TIE Fighter, we're going to select Speed 5 Straight Templates. Now, keeping our maneuvers secret, we're going to place them face down in the play area next to their respective miniatures. Now, let's switch to the Rebel side. Like I said earlier, our goal is to get the shuttle across the play space and cross the Imperial Edge to win. Therefore, our plan is to keep the shuttle moving straight ahead at a speed too straight. Our X-Wing fighter is going to match speed to provide cover for the shuttle. We will then secretly place our maneuver dial face down next to our X-Wing. Now that all the maneuver dials are face down on the gameplay space, the planning phase ends. Now we're in the activation phase. During this phase, we're going to activate each ship one at a time, starting with a ship with the lowest pilot skill. In this case, the ship with the lowest pilot skill are both of the Academy pilots with a pilot skill of 1. So first, let's move Academy pilot number 1. Academy Pilot number 1 reveals his dial. He sets the Speed 5 Straight template, executes the maneuver. This maneuver does not create pilot stress, so we're good there. He then cleans up by removing the maneuver template and replacing the maneuver dial back to the play area next to the pilot card. And now he's allowed to perform one action. Academy pilot number one is going to perform the focus action. Now we repeat the process with Academy pilot number two. Academy pilot number two reveals his dial. He places the speed five straight template, executes the maneuver, checks that there's no pilot stress, performs his cleanup, and performs his action. Academy pilot number two is also going to perform the focus action. Now we move to the red squadron pilot who has a pilot skill of four. The red squadron pilot reveals his dial, sets a speed two straight template, executes the maneuver, checks for pilot stress, there is none, performs his cleanup, and then performs his action. In this scenario, there's an additional action that can be played called the protect action. Rebel ships may perform a protect action when within range one of the Senator shuttle. When performing a protect action, the rebel player places one evade token on the senator's shuttle. So the red squadron pilot is going to use the protect action for their one action this turn. Finally, we move the senator's shuttle. We place the speed two straight template, perform the maneuver, and clean up. Now the activation phase is complete and we're ready to move on to the next phase, which is combat. 
In the combat phase, the pilot with the highest skill gets to attack first. In this case, the X-Wing pilot with a pilot skill of 4 gets to go first and declare his target. First, let's confirm which enemy ships can be targeted. We place the range ruler and trace our firing arc. TIE Fighter 1 is definitely within range, and we can just touch the base of TIE Fighter number 2. The Red Squadron pilot is going to target Academy pilot number 2. So the Red Squadron pilot rolls his three attack dice. The Red Squadron pilot rolls three critical hits. Now, Academy pilot number 2 has an agility of three and gets three defense dice to try to evade the shots. Plus, he gets an additional defense dice for being in range 3 from the X-Wing pilot. Academy Pilot 2, who apparently was not a very good student, rolls 4 blanks. This results in 3 face-up critical damage cards placed on Academy Pilot Number 2's pilot card. Unfortunately, we won't get to see the results of a damaged engine, structural damage, and a console fire. Because three critical hits absorbs all of his hull, and the ship is destroyed. Not a good day for the Empire, or the Academy's accreditation rating. Now we switch to the ship with the next highest pilot skill, which is only Academy Pilot Number 1. We place the range ruler and identify any potential targets. The X-Wing fighter is within range 2, and the Senator shuttle is within range 3. Academy Pilot Number 1 decides to declare the Senator shuttle as his target. Academy Pilot Number 1 rolls his two attack dice. He rolls one hit and one focus. Now, Academy Pilot Number 1 chooses to modify his attack roll by using his focus token to convert the focus roll to a hit. The Senator Shuttle has an agility of 2, so it gets to roll 2 defense dice. Plus 1 additional defense dice for being at a range of 3. The Senator Shuttle rolls 2 blanks and 1 focus. Now the blank is no good and the focus is no good because the Senator Shuttle does not have a focus token. However, the Senator Shuttle does have an Evade token. So the Senator Shuttle is going to spend that Evade token to nullify one of the hits. So as a result of the attack, we place one damage card on the Senator Shuttle area. And now our combat phase is complete. Now we're in the end phase. This is basically a cleanup phase where we're going to go in and remove any unused action tokens. And since we've used everything, that is complete. We did not have any target locks, so we don't need to worry about those right now. If we had any card in phase abilities to resolve, we would do that, but we don't have any of that here. So we're complete with the end phase. The last bit of housekeeping is that in this particular scenario, at the end of the end phase, if a TIE Fighter has been destroyed, then the Imperial side gets another TIE Fighter. So here we go, a new Academy Pilot number 2, fresh from the Academy. From this point, you'll keep running through the phases until either the Senator Shuttle crosses the Imperial Edge or is destroyed. I'll leave that up to you to find out. And that wraps up another episode of Harsh Rules. I'm Ben Harsh. 
I thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode.